We're so happy to have you with us, uh, Reverend Devon Johnson. Mm -hmm. uh, you work as a pastor at the uh, Windsor Village United Methodist Church mm -hmm. here in the great state of Texas. And mm -hmm. we love to come here always whenever we are in Texas and we respect your work very much. And it's such an interesting time in America because we see a divisive America, we see um, many things happening here, an elite, mm -hmm. an ultra-rich elite that own almost everything. Yeah. They use the media and the mainstream media much to their own advantage. Mm. And some of us in Europe don't find that particularly democratic. Uh, and speaking about the people and speaking about the nation and you know the regular blue collars and yeah. guys that work and live here in America, we often talk about the great Martin Luther King, who did so much for the regular folks. Mm -hmm. We would like for you to tell us a little bit about him and also the civil rights movement and in light of what's going on today. Sure, sure. Um, well, I'll say this. I, I, I don't know if I can classify myself as an expert, but he is in, entrenched in my culture. Um, he's, um, he is a symbol of what I believe we should look like as Christians to influence social change for disenfranchised groups. And so, really from Martin Luther King, you can read plenty, plenty about him, but you're talking about a guy who was obviously well-educated, hence the name, uh, the title doctor, but you heard things about I Have a Dream speech and the boycotts, and these are things you can find in movies. The part that I love about Martin Luther King the most and talking about the common person, it, it really was, about the African-American community at that time who were deprived of rights that I believe were just, it was insane of the rights that were being deprived from the people. But the fight that Martin Luther King had was a little different because the way he was going was the opposite of what was being done to the people. So the people were, uh, the African-American community was experiencing so much in violence, okay? They were being beaten, uh, you can read about Emmett Till, you can read about, there were so many things that were happening. And we're coming out of the slavery stage, but it really hadn't gone away. It was just the law had been changed a little bit, and the culture was trying to change, but it really hadn't. And so you have Martin Luther King coming in, who's trying to cause change for the common people in the political realm. This is new for, this is new for African Americans. We don't normally have a voice in that realm, but he had clout. And he had, an, he had an advantage that a lot of others didn't have. He had a voice and he had respect. And so the issue that he would always come in with is that when he wanted to influence change, uh, often people would want him to, to, to orchestrate these retaliations. And he came up with this way of doing it nonviolently. And what made him so genius to us now wasn't so much well received at first back then. So if you can imagine, you know, I'm a dad. And imagine, you know, uh, my son's walking down the street and he gets approached by a white man and he gets, he gets, he gets called all types of words and then he ends up getting jumped in, in the alleyway by a bunch of white men. And so my son comes home with broken bones, bloodied and bruised, okay? My first reaction as a father is to find the people who did it and let's handle business. The problem is, is that back then, you didn't have that option. You couldn't just retaliate. In fact, if you retaliated, you would get in trouble, but the people who did the initial contact wouldn't. And so this, the, you're in a strange place. So you have an angry father who now has to heal his son psychologically and physically, and then have to work amongst people who any of these people could have potentially been the ones that hurt his son. So you have a bunch of these incidents that never get talked about, and people are angry. And up from this community comes a man named Dr. Martin Luther King. And he comes up and he doesn't say things like, we're gonna orchestrate a way to get him back. We're gonna orchestrate a way to take out white people. He goes, we have to fight change nonviolently. That's hard. You're asking me as a father to retaliate strategically, but not violently. And everything in me, my natural instinct as a protector is that if you hurt my wife, you hurt my kids, I'm coming after you. It's my manhood speaking. And he goes, I want you to tone down the manhood and let's think about the greater good. Let's think about everybody involved. You beating up another white person ain't gonna help. 
you got to find the way strategically. So he starts orchestrating bus boycotts and he starts hitting people where it hurts to get the voices to be heard. Oh man, it was incredible the way he was doing it. And the problem that he was having was that on one hand, he's fighting the fight against predominantly whites who are against his movement. And then he's trying to keep his people at bay from doing something that could ruin the movement at any moment. Everything had to be nonviolent. We want you to sit in. We want you to, 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 to we're gonna organize our own carpools, our own taxis. We're gonna, we're gonna get around ourselves. We're gonna help each other get around. We're not gonna take buses. We're gonna, we're gonna orchestrate these things ourselves. And he's, he has to think strategically for two ends. And what makes his life so amazing was the fact that he was able to keep a group of people who had every right to be angry and he orchestrated a way to have them manage their emotions and think about the greater good on the other end, having influence and fighting in the political realm and doing whatever he could. So when you think about Martin Luther King, you don't just think about the speeches. He was a great orator. I mean, the quotes this man had were incredible. They were incredible. And, and it was those quotes that would keep our people from going off the deep end. You know, he would say, you know, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Like those kind of words make you go, man, okay, it's so we're in it for the long haul. And so you would have one group that would go, okay, we're gonna follow you. Mind you, at the same time Martin Luther King is doing this, there's another man by the name of Malcolm X. I was gonna mention him by, by and the, the Black Malcolm Panthers and, the, and all of that. And, 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 and what's misconstrued with Malcolm X is people think Malcolm X was all about violence and he was not all about violence. No. In fact, Malcolm and, and Martin had some interactions, but there were movements that were happening all around and, and all Martin was trying to do was he was saying, listen, we have to operate together. The unity that he was trying to instill was amongst the disenfranchised. He was trying to get them equity with the, with the predominant white community. It wasn't so much that he was trying to get everybody the same rights, even though he was, but he was trying to unite a people so that they can move together. He wanted nobody left behind, and he also wanted nobody getting ahead. And so he constantly found himself at these marches. So you found him in jail, or you found him right amongst the people. He wasn't some leader that was dictating instructions and watching it happen to his people. He was with them at the Selma march. You understand what I mean? When a bomb goes off in a church and kills some, some young girls, you know as a community, the church wants to retaliate. There's a certain point where you feel like, you know what, I love you, Jesus, but this hurts too much for me to let you handle that. I know vengeance is yours, but there are three young girls that are dead right now. What am I gonna do with that? And Martin Luther King would come in and the Lord would give him words to speak of peace. And he would use these moments to get up on a stage and he would start talking about a dream that would include not only black people, but the white people who were hurting the black people. This is weird stuff. Like, man, you want me to love the race that is killing my people, but I trust you, Martin. I trust you, well, go with it. You're talking about a, a, a parent who has to watch their kid die, and you want me to believe in a dream where the person who killed him is my neighbor and I have to love them. That's what he had to do. And we celebrate these speeches, but it was hard, it was hard to swallow for both sides. You want these people to be equal, and you want me to love the people who don't want me to be equal. And Martin did it. You know how incredible that is? That you could have a man with that much power, and it was so powerful that they blew his brains out. Standing on, standing on a balcony, took his life on April 4th. And so when we come together as a nation and we celebrate Martin Luther, we're celebrating somebody who has done something that has not been done since. We have yet to have a Martin Luther King rise from the ranks and find a way to fight for equity while also keeping us in a place where we don't go crazy. And so that's what we're missing today. And so I, I, I think about this and I, I don't yearn to be at that time, but I yearn to know what he was thinking when he was writing letters to wh white evangelicals in the jail cell. I, I yearn to know what kept him sane, but he was having issues at home with his own marriage, but was still fighting for families that were going through deaths. Like that, that takes a special man. And so uh, it, that is the closest I've seen a person live like Jesus. Jesus had to deal with Pharisees and Sadducees in the church while trying to raise the rights of others. So he would go out with his homeboys and they would heal people on the Sabbath and the church would get mad because that's against the rules, Jesus. He's saying, you care more about your rules than the person that I just healed. Forget the miracle, 
You don't care about the miracle. You care about the rules more than the people. And Jesus found a way to keep the people from doing something crazy, like Peter cutting off an ear. Do you understand how incredible it is to see Jesus in the garden getting ready to be arrested and somebody who loves him acts violently towards the other, towards the oppressor, towards the soldier, and he cuts the ear off and Jesus says, calm down, and then heals the person that's getting ready to arrest him. That's what Jesus did. Looks just like what Martin did. He goes, I know I'm going to jail. I need you guys to keep with the plan. Keep boycotting, nonviolence. I'm gonna go to jail. He goes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna love my oppressor. You guys just stay united. So you see, the, you, see the, you see the parallel between those two. And I yearn that our people would keep with the dream of being united, strategic and nonviolent, while also fighting in these political realms to help bring equity for all people, transgender, gay, uh, 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 immigrants. I want us to fight for all of those because they all come from God, regardless of how we act. If my son right now acts a certain way, it doesn't change the fact that he's mine. I don't love him less because he doesn't do what I want. I love him more because I want him to have the best life possible. So why would I deny him love because he doesn't do what I want? So as a church, why would we love somebody less because they're transgender? That's so, hip that's so hypocritical of us. And it's so against Martin Luther King's dream. And it's so against Jesus' mission. And it's so against God's heart. And we break his heart with that. And we deny the mission of Christ with that. And we dishonor Dr. King by doing that. If Dr. King had a chance, he would have fought for transgender and for whites and for blacks and for Muslims and for women. He would have fought for all of them. And so that's, that's what we have to get back to. At some level, on some point, we have to get back to that dream. And that dream is so important today as we live yet in another age of yeah. so many different groups in society feeling that they have no voice. Mm -hmm. Uh, feeling that the uh, mainstream media is a voice for the ultra rich, and you know, I mean, it's we see the same in Europe. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, so so wow. the, the, it, this this message is really so universal. It it, it is. It, it really applies. This this the heart of God really transcends religion, because it's about people more than it is about organization. And so even in Europe, you know, I know there's a whole lot that is happening, even with immigration laws and things like that. And uh, there are a lot of people who are refugees. When I was in Germany, there were a lot of Som Somalis who were coming into Germany. And, and that was a big deal for that country that they were, ex they were accepting so many. I have a picture that, uh, of watching. I was walking through the streets of Germany in Esslingen, and I see this young Somali kid just running, and I mean free, through the street. And you could see it on his face. I don't know where he was going. But I looked at that and I said, wow, man. I come from America that's predominantly Caucasian. I can't imagine a kid being happy running through the streets like the way this kid is in Germany right now. And for that moment, I was like, wow, I wonder if Germany really has it more together than we do, that they're accepting so many. It doesn't matter where they're from. You're hurting. This kid had, probably had no parents. He might have been six or seven years old. And for the first time in his life, probably, he was able to run without worrying about gunshots. Man, I mean, if we can't learn anything from that, then I don't think we should be a nation. <laughs> We should really find a different way to do things because that's what I believe God's heart looks like, you know? Thank you very much for taking the time to tell us about uh, the great uh, Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really see it was so right of us to come to America wow. and to listen to what you have to teach us as Europeans here. Uh, and we sure need this kind of teaching today as we're all breaking apart in hatred and dislike and, and it's all about ethnic groups and all of these things and we need to bridge that yes. and we're so glad that we were able to come to Texas to have this teaching uh, and we will take it to heart and bring it with us back to Europe so thank you, thank you very much thank Reverend uh, Devon Johnson for taking the time and giving us this spiritual advice and telling us this story about this great, great American. Thank you.